Good evening. Great to see you all. Uh, you will uh, find it helpful to have page 1188 in the Church Bibles open in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5 as we look at that passage. You may be thinking, why are we looking at 1 Thessalonians 5? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, the first is I was preaching on this passage at Fresh Book this morning. That's the main reason, if I'm being honest. Um, they were going through 1 Thessalonians, uh, and so I preached that this morning uh, with them. But also I thought, we're halfway through the year, aren't we? The end of June. And this is our year verse, thinking about the victory that comes through our Lord Jesus, the eternal victory that we have. And it's helpful for us, sort of halfway through the year, to think about that, to think about the hope that we have of eternal life, of victory that comes through knowing Jesus. And 1 Thessalonians 5 speaks very well about the hope that we have as Christians. Now, I suspect that uh, many of us, most of us, have a diary of some sort. Perhaps it's an electronic diary. I use my phone as a diary. Perhaps you have a paper one, or maybe you have a diary that hangs up in the kitchen. When we have diaries, we write down important things, things that we need to remember, a date that's coming up that we have to do something as a result. So perhaps you're on a rotor at church, perhaps you're opening up the church building, or you're serving tea and coffee, or you're doing something, and you write it down because you know you've got to do something, you've got to turn up at a certain time or get something ready for that. Or if you've got a friend coming to visit, perhaps staying for the weekend, you need to mark that in your diary because you need to know you've got to get some food in the house, you've got to make up the bed, you've got to do something to receive a friend. Or perhaps you're going on holiday, and you will definitely make sure you write that in your diary because you know you've got to turn up at the airport at a certain time to queue up for hours on end. But you've got to mark that because the, the future date, the date, means you've got to do something in the here and now. It affects what you're doing now. And in this passage in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is talking about the date, the date of the Lord Jesus' return. Not that we know exactly when it is, but we've got to mark it in the sense of we've got to do something about that now. We've got to live in a way that is anticipating what is going to happen, the future date. How should we live in light of the return of Jesus? What should we be like as God's people as we await his return? And there are three things in our passage. Uh, first of all, um, a mistake to avoid. A mistake to avoid. Now, the mistake is that some people either don't believe that Jesus is going to return or they don't know it. They are ignorant of the fact that Jesus is going to return. That mistake is not the mistake that the Thessalonians uh, were falling for. If you look down at verse 1, verse 1 says, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. They knew that the Lord Jesus would return. They were not ignorant of that, not least because in chapter 4, verse 16, he's just written, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He's just told them that. <laughs> he's just written that in the letter. He'd spent time with them. He'd taught them. They knew this. They knew that the Lord Jesus was going to return. They were not ignorant of it, and yet, he wants to write to them to remind them, to remind them that Jesus was coming back, and specifically to remind them that the return of Jesus would be the day of the Lord. You can see that in uh, verse 2. He says, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, the day of the Lord was a common Old Testament expression. Perhaps you've read it in the Old Testament. Many of the prophets are full of the phrase, the day of the Lord, particularly the prophet Joel. But many of them talk about the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, when God himself would put everything right. The day of the Lord was particularly a day when God would punish evildoers. All that was wrong, all that was evil in the world would be corrected. It was a day of punishment, of vengeance, where God would right all that's wrong. The day of the Lord. It was a day where God's people in the Old Testament longed for, they hoped for this day, when God one day would put everything right. And Paul here is saying that day of the Lord, that Old Testament day of the Lord, is fulfilled in the day of the Lord Jesus. 
It's when Christ returns that the day of the Lord will be. Christ himself, the, the Lord's own son, the divine second person of the Trinity, the Messiah, he will be the one who fulfills the day of the Lord. What a thought that would have been for uh, first century Jews. The hope of the Old Testament day of the Lord fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth when he returns. And this day of the Lord will happen, verse 2 says, suddenly like a thief in the night. Now last week um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I woke up from my sleep because I heard footsteps. And so I got out of bed and got my phone and put my torchlight on my phone. And I stood on the landing for a minute because I assumed that the footsteps were coming from uh, one of the children's rooms. Sometimes they do like to get up in the night and uh, either go to the toilet or sometimes play with their toys, one of them is known to do, at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I stood on the landing waiting with their bedrooms around, listening to see whether I could hear the noise. And I couldn't hear anything. And then I thought to myself, that means... I've got to go downstairs. So I sort of crept down with my torchlight. And if you've ever done this, as I guess many of you have done, it's pretty nerve-wracking at points. It's, it, you can feel the sort of adrenaline rush. So I checked the one room, nothing. Went into the other room, nothing. Tried the sort of patio doors, tried the front door. Went into all the rooms, nothing. There's nothing there. I'd obviously imagined it, or perhaps I dreamt footsteps. I don't know. But that sort of feeling is unnerving, isn't it? There could be a thief coming in the night, the whole point of a thief breaking is they don't tell you when it's going to be. And that is the picture of the return of Jesus in verse 2. In fact, Jesus himself says it in the Gospels. It will be sudden, unexpected, not like, a sort of, uh, not like the plumber that you've booked to come in at a certain time, not like a guest who you know when he's coming, but like a thief in the night. Sudden, unexpected. And it will be something that we cannot escape from. That's what verse 3, uh, this image of uh, labor pains in verse 3. People will be saying, peace and safety, but destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, every time Becca has been uh, pregnant, uh, one of the first things we've done when that positive test comes back is we've, the, one of the very first things has been to find out when the due date will be. Because you know that all being well... The baby's going to be born sort of within that rough window of the due date. They're never born on the due date, are they? But it's within a rough window. Because you know that all, all being well, the baby's going to come at that time. And particularly in verse 3 when it talks about uh, labor pains coming. When a woman goes into labor, the baby's coming. You can't do much about it at that point. It's going to come. It's inevitable. You can't escape that then. That's the image here. Jesus will return. It is inevitable. It will not be able to be escaped from. The point Paul makes, the first three verses is, the Lord Jesus is going to come back. He will return. Don't make the mistake of thinking it won't happen. Don't think that it's just far off or a fairy tale or make-believe. Jesus will return. It will be sudden, unexpected, and it will be the day of the Lord when all that's wrong in the world will be put right again. So a mistake to avoid uh, but secondly, a way to live. This really is the bulk of the passage. A way to live. Now, I wonder, if I said to you, what does it mean to be a Christian? What is a Christian's identity? There will be so many ways that we could answer that. So many different ways that the, the New Testament or the Old Testament describes what it means to live as God's people. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, verse 5 gives us a wonderful image. Paul says... You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means to be a child, a son or daughter of the daytime, not the nighttime. It's a lovely picture. Belonging to the day and not to the night. That's not a surprise because Jesus is the light of the world. He comes into the darkness to dispel the darkness. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all, one John says. God himself is light, and therefore God's people are to be those who live in the light, who have been brought into the light. It means, of course, that to be a Christian is a radical change. To be a Christian is not merely just 
sort of finding that, that extra puzzle piece that sort of completes your life, or like your life was missing a little bit and Jesus is the sort of top up. To be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus is to be born again. It's a radical transformation of your life. To be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son, Colossians says. To be brought into the light, having formerly been in darkness, but brought into the daytime, into the light. A totally different orientation in life. A radical change to be a child of light, not of darkness. And it means we shouldn't be surprised, verse 4. He says, but you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. We have God's revelation. We have the Spirit living in us. We are in the light. We can read God's words to us. But also, because we're in the light, we should live as people in the light. Now, I love uh, living in Old Town. Um, I love town gardens. But I also love being uh, amongst the sort of the busyness uh, of, you may, perhaps you may not think that Old Town is particularly busy. Coming from Cambran, Old Town is like a metropolis. <laughs> um, but the sort of the bars, the restaurants, um, the shops, is a nice feel to Old Town, I think. It's a sort of busyness. I like that. Um, but as you know, anywhere where there's sort of bars and restaurants, it feels different at night, doesn't it? There's a sort of nighttime behavior that is different to daytime behavior. Verse 7, Paul says, Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Now, of course, this is a, a big generalization. You may know people who sleep in the daytime and who get drunk in the daytime. But the point that Paul's making is there's a certain style of behavior that fits well at night. And we see that in bars and restaurants. People uh, spill out into the street, perhaps drunk, perhaps fighting, perhaps being sick, but they wouldn't do that in the daytime. That's stuff that happens at night. And if you don't believe me, think about this. What would it be like to walk down Wood Street at 2 p.m. or 2 a.m.? Very different, I imagine. Darkness and light. The point that Paul is making, verse 6, so then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. Verse 8, since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. We are daytime people, not nighttime people, Paul says. We are to be alert, sober-minded, anticipating the day of the Lord. Not uh, letting our minds be clouded, whether that's through alcohol or through worldliness or whatever. We're daytime people, and we are to live as that. And specifically, we're to get dressed. Uh, that's what verse 8 is saying. Let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate. Putting on the hope of salvation as a helmet. We're to put on things because we're in the daytime. Now, if you remember back to Zoom... Uh, perhaps you are in work and maybe you had lots of Zoom meetings at work. And sometimes at Zoom meetings at work, people keep their cameras off. And that means when it was in the height of the pandemic, you could be wearing your pajamas in the middle of the day. No one would know. Perhaps you had your dressing gown on. Perhaps you'd not brushed your hair. You had your bed head. No one would know because you had your camera off. And even when we were doing church on Zoom, um, we could only sort of see the top half. Perhaps you had your pajama bottoms on. But it's different now, particularly if you're going into the office. If you've got a meeting with your boss tomorrow morning in person at 11 o'clock in the morning, you're not going to be wearing your pyjamas, are you? You're not wearing your pyjamas now, thankfully. Why? It's not daytime attire. It's nighttime attire. It's night clothing. It's not appropriate for the daytime. And Paul is saying here... There is, a, there is a daytime clothing that we are to put on. As children of the day, we are to put on the breastplate and the helmet. Verse 8, he's talking about faith, hope, and love. That is what we are to put on. That's the clothing that children of the day are to be wearing. But it's also mixed in, verse 8, with this military language, isn't it? The sort of breastplate, the helmet. This is... 
language perhaps you know in Ephesians 6, Paul talks about this, or in Isaiah 59 is where it originates. This sort of uh, military battle, perhaps we would in a sort of modern sense put, uh, put it into modern phrase of putting on camouflage or putting on body armor, putting on night vision goggles. But it's that military attire, that military uh, clothing that verse 8 is faith, hope, and love. Basic Christian virtues. Paul says what it means to live as a child of the day is to put on those things, to be marked as people who are full of faith, hope, and love. Now, the thing here about the Thessalonians was they were already marked by that. Keep a finger in chapter 5. Go back to chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says, We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope. So he says at the beginning of the letter, you are marked by faith, hope, and love. And towards the end of the letter, he says, put on faith, hope, and love. In other words, these characteristics were already, already marked in the Thessalonians. They were already full of faith, hope, and love. But Paul says to live as a Christian is to continue to put on faith, hope, and love, to continue in that way. The Christian battle, to use the military language in verse 8, is to continue in the, in the way that we have been, in being marked by faith, by hope, and by love. Sometimes you perhaps read Christian books or you go into Christian bookshops, and there are all sorts of books on Christian living, on Christian discipleship. And sometimes books sort of claim to be the silver bullet in how, it, how, you, how we ought to live as a church, how we ought to live as Christians, you know, sort of 10 practical ways, practical steps, and so on. There may be some value to that, but basic Christian living is pretty basic. It's faith, hope, and love. Faith in, in Christ, in God. Love for him, love for one another, and a hope, a hope that one day he will return. These are the marks of the Thessalonians. This is what Paul says it means to live as a Christian, to put on these things. In other words, maturity comes not from knowing all these extra stuff, but by applying those things more and more, by appropriating those things for ourselves, pressing deeper into those things in our life. Now, you may, um, you may have been a Christian for a long time. Perhaps you've been in this church for ages. Perhaps you've been a Christian for a lot longer uh, than I've even been alive. Perhaps you've heard so many uh, Bible sermons, so many Bible stories. How will you live as a mature Christian, as a child of the day. What does it mean for you to be a child of the daytime? Well, it means continuing what you're already doing, being marked by faith, hope, and love. Continuing in those things. Or maybe you're a lot younger. Uh, maybe you've got many, many, many decades to be living as a Christian. How are you going to live the next 50 years on this planet as a Christian? by being marked with faith, hope, and love. It's the same thing. Faith in Christ, love for God and his people and the world around us, and a hope in the return of the Lord Jesus. Basic things, but that's what it means to be a Christian. Hoping in his return. So a mistake to avoid, a way to live, and finally, a hope to encourage. And the language of hope leads us to these final three verses. We are all searching for hope, aren't we? We all, as human beings, are longing for hope, searching for it. It's why things like Hope Explored, which starts again this week, it's why things like that have so much resonance with us, because we're longing for things. We may be longing for uh, the price of things to go down. We may be longing, uh, hoping that we'll do better financially or that we won't be struggling as much. Perhaps we're hoping for a spouse or a child or a better job. But the thing is, sometimes hope is just wishful thinking. We sort of hope it, but it's, it's just a vague sense of optimism. But the Christian hope is not that. 
The Christian hope is a firm hope. It's based on what God has done for us. Verse 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that we can have hope is not wishful thinking. It's based on what God has done for us. It's based on what God has already done for us in Christ. Do you see the link between verses 8 and 9? You know, put on hope for, because God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. That's why we have hope, because of God's actions for us in Christ. The fact that God has, uh, in the language of verse 9, he has appointed us, chosen us, elected us for salvation. Not because of anything we've done, but entirely because of his grace and mercy. All that he has done for us in sending his son to bleed for us, to die on the cross for us, so that we could go free. Because of that, uh, therefore, we have hope. Verse 9, God has not appointed us to receive wrath because Christ has received that wrath for us. And therefore, he's given us salvation. That's what he uh, has said that we can receive. Not wrath, but salvation. In fact, furthermore, verse 10 says, we're joined to Jesus. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we may live together with him. I am joined to Jesus. If we have faith in Christ, we are joined to him, united to him. And therefore, verse 10, uh, whether we are awake or asleep, and here asleep means dead, doesn't mean the same thing as it means uh, in verse 6 and so on. It's not negative sense here. Whether we're alive or whether we're dead, awake or asleep, we will be with Christ. We will be with him. We are joined, body and soul, to Jesus so that whatever happens to us, we will be with him forever. We're joined, united to Jesus. When we die, our souls will go immediately to be with him. In fact, some of the, um, some of the Reformed catechisms, if you're into this, as I am, um, say... When we die, our souls go to be with Christ, and our bodies, still being united to Christ, lie in the ground until the day of resurrection. That's the Westminster Shorter Catechism and uh, the Baptist Catechism, for those of you interested. I can see none of you are. The point is, even our bodies in the ground are still united to Jesus. That's a thought, isn't it? It's not just that our souls go to be with Jesus, that is true, praise God, but actually our bodies themselves are important. Why? Because they'll be raised one day. So whether they're in the ground or whether we've been cremated, they are joined to Jesus, spiritually joined to him like we are now, because one day Jesus is going to raise those bodies. Our very bodies that are in the ground will be raised to new life. We will always be with Jesus body and soul. It's an extraordinary thought. Now, you may well have heard that before. Perhaps this is not new news to you. But we live in a world which is full of the here and now, <coughs> the living for the moment, short-termism. But there is more to come. There is an eternity, a victory that we will receive through our Lord Jesus Christ all because of what Christ has done in the gospel. And it means that the victory is secure. The language of battle, the language of, uh, of military battle, of striving in the Christian life, is not a language of battle where we don't know the outcome. It's not going into a battle where we don't know how the war will end. We know how it will end. The victory has already been won at the cross. Jesus has died. He's been risen again to new life, and therefore the Christian life is a battle at times, and yet it is in the knowledge that we will receive the victory, that Christ has done it all. It's a battle 
with that knowledge, knowing that it's been secured at the cross. And therefore, Paul says in verse 11, because that's true, encourage one another, build one another up, just as in fact you are doing. One of the most important things we can do as a church is encourage each other, to have a ministry of encouragement. Now, some people are really good at encouraging each other. We know perhaps you can think of people in the church who are just really good encouragers. And that's great. I think some people are particularly gifted at encouraging others. Even if that's not the case, we're all to encourage each other. Verse 11 says that. We are to be a church family that reminds one another of these things. Look at four, chapter 4, verse 18. Paul says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 5, verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Bookmarked. This passage is bookmarked by a command to encourage one another. Get the point, don't we? We are to encourage each other with these things. So as we close, how do we encourage each other? What does it look like? I think there are two senses to it. We speak it and we show it. We speak encouragement and we show encouragement. We need to speak it. We need to remind each other of these truths. These truths need to be on our, on our lips, on our conversations with one another, on our prayers for each other. We're a family, a church family, and that means we have uh, family responsibilities to one another, to care for each other, to look out for each other in our walks. You need to speak these things to me to remind me of these things. I need to hear them from you. You need to hear them from each other. Sometimes when people are struggling, we need to get alongside people and remind them of these truths. Sometimes when people are, are lackluster, perhaps stagnant, we need to get alongside one another and remind each other of these truths to encourage each other. We need to speak it, but ultimately we need to show it. We need to live it. We are to live it in such a way to be children of the daytime, so marked in our lives by, by faith, by hope and love, so treasuring Jesus, having him as the supreme joy and love of our hearts, that we encourage one another in the way that we're living. We show that it's worth living for Christ. We model it to each other. We spur one another on as examples that we are living as children of the light in view of Christ's coming. That's what's going to encourage us to keep going as we see each other living like that. After all, verse 9, God has not appointed us, Swindon Evangelical Church, to suffer wrath on the day of the Lord, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus. Isn't that encouraging? Isn't that a good message to share with each other?